If you have a Bible, let's open up once again to Mark chapter 11. And you may be thinking, how much can we learn from Mark chapter 11? We don't even know yet. We keep learning. Jesus keeps speaking things. And this Bible is so special of a book. There's no book like this. Listen, every word of this was written with you in mind. Don't you believe this is some ancient book that was written to other people without you in mind? That's not true. This is an inspired book. And every word that was inspired was inspired by the Holy Spirit who had you in mind. So there are embedded messages in here. And if you don't realize that about the Bible, you'll read it like it's just another book from the past. And it's not. When I learned this, I began to open up my heart when I opened up my eyes. And God would speak to me through this as if it was written to me. And this is, this is why we say, this is my Bible. It's God speaking to me. And if you don't realize that, you'll treat it like a regular book, and then you won't hear. You'll be spiritually deaf. I pray all spiritual deafness is healed in this place today. And that you begin to realize God is real and he speaks. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. So if you're not hearing from God, what's up? Because <laughs> Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. You're going to hear from God today in Jesus' name. Okay, now, I began this little study last week called God's Promises to You, because there are promises in the Bible that are not just for other people, they are for you. And today I want to talk to you about this. Here's the title, Prepare to Receive. Prepare to Receive. Get ready. Prepare to Receive. You know, the Israelites were in Egypt for over 400 years. By the time Moses got there to deliver them from Egypt... The people that were living at the time, the Israelites that were living at the time, they were slaves their whole lives. And so Moses came and said, God said, let my people go. I'm getting you out. That was hard for many people to believe. Really? All these years? And it's so hard? How are we getting out? And so Moses told Pharaoh, God said, let my people go. He said, who's the Lord? Who, is, who are you talking about? I don't know who that is. No. And so here come the plagues. And the first few plagues, they hit everybody. The land of Egypt, the land of Goshen, the Israelites, everybody. Isn't that right? And that was bad. And the people of Israel were like, get, get out of here, Moses. Like It's worse since you came. But then God made a division between the land of Goshen, where the Israelites were, and the land of Egypt. And the plagues began to come on the Egyptians only. You remember this? But plague after plague would come, and then Moses would say, let him go. And Pharaoh would say, no, 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 no. And this went on for quite some time. And so when we got to the last plague, and here's what the Lord said. The Lord said, Moses, tell all of the Israelites, tell them all to get a lamb, a lamb for a household. And to take that lamb, and it needs to be a spotless lamb, because, of course, it represented Jesus, the Messiah, to come. Get a spotless lamb, and then everybody's going to barbecue it. Don't boil it. Don't cook it another way. Everybody's going to barbecue the lamb in fire. You're going to roast it in fire. And so, you know, depending on exactly how many, there may have been about a quarter of a million barbecued lambs that afternoon. Can you imagine what the sky looked like and what it smelled like? The Egyptian would say, what are those crazy Jews doing? But that sure does smell good. <laughs> Everybody loves barbecue, right? And so... They're barbecuing these lambs, but here's what God said. God said, but you need to eat this lamb, this Passover lamb, in a certain way. You need to get fully dressed for travel. Have your walking shoes on. Have your walking staff in your hand. Your belt, I mean everything on. And have your bags packed over on the, in the side of the room. And then you need to eat in a hurry because this is the Lord's Passover. Because this night, I am going to go through the land of Egypt. And every household where there's not a blood of a lamb on the side doorpost and on the lentil of the door, there's going to be a dead person in there. The firstborn in that house is going to be dead. And that's exactly what happened. Now, you can imagine how the Israelis, the Israelites felt. They felt like, how do we know that's going to happen? I mean, all of our lives we've been here suffering like this. And then Moses keeps saying we're getting out. And then Pharaoh just keeps saying, no, last we heard, the newspaper said, Pharaoh said, no way. And Pharaoh even said, and Moses, don't even come see me anymore. I don't want to see your face again. That's what the headline was. 
And now all of a sudden we're supposed to be barbecuing lambs and packing our bags and eating fully dressed and eating in a hurry? Why? For what? But for some reason, they did it. And they prepared for God to do a miracle. And what happened? In the middle of the night, when the death angel was going out throughout all the land of Egypt and every house that did not have the blood on it, which was most all of the Egyptians' homes. Uh, tradition passed down has said that some of the Egyptians started listening to the Israelites because they knew they were God and actually did the same thing. But that's not considered in the scripture. But nonetheless, in the middle of the night, the Egyptians started wailing and mourning and a big cry went out and it hit Pharaoh's own house. His own firstborn son was dead. And he summoned Moses and Aaron and said, get out, get out now, take everybody, take the animals, you get out now. And he drove them out in the middle of the night because God said so and because they prepared. Because God said so and because they prepared. I want to show you how you must prepare to receive. You don't just wait and when it happens, it slaps you in the face and you say, oh, my prayer came to pass. Oh, what do you know? No, the Bible teaches us we need to prepare to receive. We need to operate in faith. And I want to show you this. Let's read this passage here first from Mark chapter 11, the 22nd through the 24th verses. I'm going to read from the New King James. If you don't have that, that's all right. But follow along on the screens just so that as we all read aloud, we'll all read the same words. Mark 11, 22 to 24. Let's not read this like it's, you know, some Marvel comic book. Let's read this as if it is the word of God, because it is. Ready? Everybody together, verses 22 to 24, loudly and together. Let's read. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Now, let's talk about preparing to receive. How do you prepare to receive? Well, let me tell you, first of all, you need to know that God wants to bring these promises to pass. But number one, we need to ask according to his will. First John 5, 14 and 15 saying, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we've asked of him. So if we ask according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we know that we'll get it. Now, how many of you remember a man in the Bible named Adonijah? How many of you recognize the name, but you don't actually remember who he is, right? Sometimes we recognize these names. Adonijah. How many of you never heard of this guy in your life? Right? Okay. So Adonijah had a famous father. Anybody know the name of his father? King David. This was a son of King David, Adonijah. So he had this great advantage of being the king's son. Not only the king, but the favored king, the man after God's own heart. He was blessed. And so now we're at the end of David's reign, 40 years of his reign. David's still alive, but he's old. He's not functioning a whole lot in terms of, you know, making new policies because everything's all set up and really what he wants to do is to build a temple, but God won't let him build it because he's been a man of war and he's got a lot of blood on his hand. God said, your son Solomon, when he becomes king, he can build the temple. And so David is just playing out his final days and Adonijah sees it and he sees that, oh man, my father's going to die pretty soon and somebody's got to succeed the throne. And so Adonijah had it in mind you know what? Who better than me? Who better than me? I'm one of the king's sons. I have favor. People will naturally want one of David's sons. In fact, God promised that one of David's sons would be on the throne. In fact, God promised David, one of your sons will be on the throne forever because God intended that one of David's descendants would be Jesus who would sit on the throne of Israel forever. 
See, and so he promised that. And so Adonijah said, who better than me? And so Adonijah went and he conferred with Joab, who was the military commander of David's army. And so Joab had the influence of the military. And so he could control the military. And he also went and conferred with Abiathar, the priest. And so now he's got influence in the priesthood. And so they, those people had influence. And so they gathered an entourage around Adonijah. And they came and blew the trumpet and announced Adonijah is the king. Everybody hail the king. Long live the king. Long live King Adonijah. And everything seemed to be going well. Oh, great. But there's a big problem. That was not the will of God. That was not the will of God. So he had it all figured out. He took steps. He made himself king. But that was not the will of God. The will of God was that Solomon would be king. See, you can aspire to bring promises to pass, but they have to be according to the will of God. So yeah, the Bible says promotion comes from the Lord. That's great. But that doesn't mean every promotion possibility is from the Lord for you. You have to know what promotion do you want to give me? Isn't that right? Because just because I have ambition, just because I aspire to it, just because I think that's the next step, that doesn't mean it's your will for my life. I need to ask according to his will. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we've asked of him. So you might say, yeah, but it worked for Adonijah. He became the king. He did for a very short period of time. <laughs> because when David, the king, heard about this, even though he was old, he's not dead. And David called together people like Nathan the prophet and other priests. And he called Solomon. And he called Benaiah, who was the mighty man that was sort of the, the security for, for David. And he was, he was the one that led all the other mighty men. And David called all of them together and said, the Lord said Solomon is to be my successor, not Adonijah. Go seat Solomon on my throne and blow the trumpet, hail the king, Long live Solomon, and that's exactly what they did. And when the nation heard that King David had made Solomon the king, Adonijah's reign was over. In fact, when Adonijah and Joab and Abiathar and that gang found out that David had put Solomon on the throne and everybody was, was coming to Solomon now, they scattered and ran because they knew we're in trouble. And Adonijah came to Solomon and, and tried to make things good and make things up. And Solomon decided, I'm not going to... I'm not going to kill you right now because you tried to take the throne away from me, even though God was wanting me to have it. But he said, but I'm going to give you some very clear parameters. And guess what? He crossed the line later on and he lost his life. He lost his life. He tried to promote himself out of the will of God and lost his life over it. See, we must ask according to God's will. We must ask according to God's will. What if Adonijah would have yielded himself to the will of God? Well, somebody said, well, then he wouldn't have been king. He wasn't anyway. I said he wasn't anyway. He's dead. He's dead. Isn't that right? He wasn't anyway. See, we have to ask according to his will. What if Adonijah would have inquired and found out, oh, Solomon, God has chosen Solomon to be king. Let me go to Solomon and say, Solomon, you know, our father has said that God has shown him that you are to be king. I'm going to get behind you. I want, I want to be in the will of God. I want to help you. I want to support you. I want to be right there for you. Don't you know he would have been given a prominent position, an influential position. He would have been able to make something happen, to have a great impact for the rest of his life and be esteemed. Is that right? And maybe when Solomon was going astray, he may have been able to be there and say, brother, Brother, don't do that. Don't marry all those foreign wives. Don't build those temples to foreign gods using the wealth that God has given you against him. Don't do that, brother. But he lost all opportunity because he promoted himself out of the will of God. See, so you can't just take promises in the Bible. Well, it says right there, 
Yeah, whatever I'm asking, you know, God wants to promote me, so I got my eyes on this. No, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask according to his will, he hears us. If we ask according to his will, when it's time to promote you, there's one promotion from God, and all the other options are out of his will. All the other options are out of his will. Is that right? Okay, so we need to ask according to his will. But not only that, we need to ask with the right motives. Listen to what it says in James 4, 2 and 3. You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. Look at verse 3. You ask and do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives, so that you may spend what you request on your pleasures. You're asking with the wrong motive so that you may spend what you request on your own pleasure. What does that mean? You may be asking for the promotion that is the will of God. But what you have in mind is how respected you'll be and how that's going to make you more wealthy. That's more money for me. You're not thinking about how you can use that position to benefit others and serve others. In this kingdom, we don't do things for ourselves. No, no. We do things for other people. We do things for the Lord. Jesus said, that's the way the Gentiles live. The Gentiles are chasing. What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? How are we going to get more money? And Jesus said, but that's not you. You seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and those things that others are chasing will be added to you, not by you, to you. They'll be added to you. See, and so in this kingdom, you may even have your sight set on the right thing that is the will of God. But if your motives are wrong, you disqualify yourself. If your motives are wrong, so you have to yield not only to the will of God, but you have to yield your attitude. You have to yield your heart. You have to yield your motives because otherwise your selfish ambition will come into that position and destroy destroy human nature human nature so we must submit to the will of God you remember Jesus taught us to submit to the will of God in the Lord's prayer he said pray like this our father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come and what your will be done Jesus said don't start off praying your will Lord this is what I need Lord I'm asking you to do this and do that no that's starting off with our will No, he said, the first thing you need to do is to recognize that you don't know much compared to God. You're just one little human being among eight billion on this planet, not counting those who have already died and those who are yet to be born. And you have a very limited perspective from your family and your neighborhood and your education, which is very small, no matter how many degrees you might have. And you're coming to the creator of all things who knows everyone and knows everything about everyone and knows exactly what needs to happen so that the maximum amount of people can be saved. So Jesus is saying, when you come to God, don't come in like you know something. Come in recognizing that he knows everything. And that first you need to fall into alignment with his will. Our Father in heaven, oh Hallowed, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. This is priority, not my kingdom. Your kingdom come. And your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, I yield to the higher plan. I yield to the wiser being, my God. And then I come into alignment. And everything I ask for needs to be in your will and according to your plan. This is how Jesus taught us to pray. This is nothing new that we're talking about. This is what he taught. This is what he taught. I remember when I was in Bible college. Now, I had given my life for the Lord. He had changed me so much. He had revealed his word to me, delivered me from the bondage of lust. Oh, it filled me with confidence. I began to hear him speak to me and guide me. And I knew, oh man, I went from being bound and struggling and insecure to being confident God's going to use me to do something. 
I was so thankful to him. I wanted to serve him, do whatever he wanted. And now I'm in Bible college and I'm you know, studying because I know God has a plan and he led me there. Well, then, you know, I'm also praying to him about other things. Like, Lord, I want, I want the right wife. Lord, give me the right wife. And there was a young lady there in Bible college that loved the Lord with all of her heart. And she's going after the things of God. And so we began to connect and began to date. And she, would, she was so godly. She would always ask me, did you spend time with Jesus today? Well, I haven't yet because I, I worked late, you know, last night. Uh, Jerry Dearman, <laughs> you need to spend time with Jesus today. I mean, that, that's what, the way she was. And, of course, I know I, I need a godly wife, somebody that's after the Lord like I'm after the Lord. And that's what I asked him for. And so, well, my emotions started getting attached to this gal to where I was already, my heart was already saying, man, I want to marry this gal. She loves the Lord. She likes me. She's cute. This must be God. (laughs) But I kept saying to the Lord, but Lord, I want your will because I know that my emotions are vulnerable to miss it. Emotions are not God. If you follow your emotions, you will miss God time and again. And I knew my emotions do not mean it's God's will. Just because it feels good does not mean it's good. And so I kept yielding to the Lord. Lord, don't let me make a mistake. Lord, I know that you have a plan and I want that plan. But Lord, if she's a part of that plan, then bring this about. But I kept saying, like Jesus, but not my will, but yours be done. But not my will, but yours be done. And you know the story if you've been around because that fizzled out. Thank God. Thank God. Not by her, but by me. In my heart, I knew. I knew, but I believe I knew by prayer that the Lord helped me to discern that. And I phased that out and met Kimberly Diaz. Mm -mm 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 -mm. (laughs) Now that's the will of God. That was the right promotion right there for me, okay? See, but I had to yield to the will of God. So see, I had scripture. Oh, look right there. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Whatever you ask, Father, in my name, he'll give you. Give me her. I said, no, I don't know 100% for sure that that's your will. So Lord, I'm asking for your will. How many of you see the difference? See, there's some things where you know the will of God and other things you don't know. You think you know you want it to be true, but you have to yield to the will of God. And this is what Jesus taught us to do. But you know, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught us to go on and pray, give us this day our daily bread. So he said, pray for the things you have need of too. Isn't that right? Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, sins, as we forgive our debtors, those who sin against us. Forgive us our sins. Notice Jesus is saying, look, you gotta be right with God. You can't just say, yeah, I know I'm sinning everything, but I just need you to give me this and give me that. That's not the way this works, Jack. God's not the blue genie that comes out of the bottle when you rub it just to do whatever you want. He is your creator. He is the almighty God. And he loves you with all of his heart. But no, you you cannot just continue to live in sin and like the world and in selfishness and expect God to adhere to you. But if you'll align yourself under his will and under his goodness, you'll see how blessed your life begins to be, how enriched it begins to be. And so we need to yield ourselves to the Lord. Now, do you remember this guy, Jesus, healed this lame man who had been lame all those years, and now he's up and walking by the power of God? And Jesus said this to him in 514 of John. He said, afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said, see, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. What is Jesus implying here? That you're in sin, you've been sinning, and you've been struggling with this lameness, this physical disability, wanting to be healed, but it's not happening. But now you're healed. But now sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. What does that mean? Sin will open the door to the devil putting something on you. 
And Jesus said, if you keep sinning from this point, he'll put something worse on you than was already on you. Isn't that right? So see, Jesus is telling us that sin is one of many reasons why we don't receive the promises of God, even though God wants us to have them. Sin is one of many reasons. Years ago, I did a study looking in the Bible at all the scenarios where believers, the people of God, did not receive the promises of God. And I found at least 30 reasons that the Bible gives us. And not one of them was, well, they did everything right, but God just decided not to keep his promise. Never. It's not in the Bible. Not in the Bible. But there are 30 plus reasons. In fact, we just went over one a minute ago from... From James that said, you ask and don't receive because you had the wrong motives. I need to add that to my list. Had the wrong motives in your prayer. You had the wrong motives in your prayer. You were going to spend what you were asking for on yourself for selfish reasons. See, that's a blockade. That's a reason. Well, what do you do? When you see that, you're like, oh, Lord, forgive me. I was thinking about myself. I don't know about you, but I have to, I have to confess that to God because my mind, my flesh will think about myself and I have to say, oh, no, 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 Lord. I hear, I, I'm hearing a thought here that's thinking about how that'll benefit me. Lord, I submit that to you. My life's not about benefiting me. My life's about benefiting your kingdom and other people. Amen. And Lord, you, you take responsibility for taking care of me. See, but I have to bring that underneath the Lord's will and into alignment just like you do. Come on, say amen. I know it. I know you're just as bad or worse. <laughs> yeah, that's right, because you're human. You're human. But here, go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. Listen to what James 5.16 says. Confess your trespasses one to another, to one another, and pray for one another. Watch this. That you may be healed that you may be healed. It's blocking your healing. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. See, there's another one right there. You're not confessing your trespass. You know you're sinning. You know it's disobedient. You know it's wrong. But you just keep thinking, if I ignore it, maybe God doesn't notice. Well, of course he notices. He knows everything about everything. Isn't that right? Of course he notices. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another. Well, why do I have to confess it to other people? Because you need them to pray because you've confessed it to God before, but you're not good at holding yourself accountable. You need some of that positive peer pressure for people saying, how you doing? It's hoping you wouldn't ask. Isn't that right? But when you get other people agreeing with you, it gives you that strength to be able to do what you should do and stop doing what you shouldn't do. Pray for one another that you may be healed, that you may be healed. Listen to Psalm 107, 17. Fools, fools, fools. Tell the person next to you, he's talking to you now. <laughs> fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Why were they afflicted? Because of their transgressions and because of their iniquities. It, sin down in the heart. Iniquities. Okay. They were afflicted. Verse 18, their soul abhorred all manner of food. They got so sick, they didn't want to eat. They, I don't want anything to eat. And they drew near to the gates of death. But watch this. Verse 19, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. Finally, they got desperate enough to humble themselves, to cry out to the Lord. They're looking to be forgiven. They're looking to be restored. They're looking to be healed. They're calling on God. Finally. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed the fools. Isn't that what that's saying? God sent his word and healed fools. Yeah, and delivered them from their destruction. Come on, tell the person next to you there's hope for you. Yeah, but what do we need to do? Notice they came into alignment with God's will. Can you see that? Notice they changed. They came into alignment with God's will. We should start there. Let's just start with the will of God. But we all know how we are sometimes, and we don't. But when you realize, hey, man, adverse effects are coming onto my life that are not in line with the promises of God. Something must be wrong. Lord, is it me? Am I out of alignment? And if you are, repent. Repent. 
Because you can see God will have mercy on you. God will have mercy. Listen to Deuteronomy 7, 9. Therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. He keeps covenant and mercy with a thousand generations, not just one or two people, I mean a thousand generations, with those who love him and keep his commandments. With those who love him and keep his commandments. Somebody said, we're not under the Old Testament law anymore. We're under grace. Really? Because it seems to me, like I heard Jesus say, I saw it in red letters, if you love me, keep my commandments. Seems like he's talking about New Testament. If you love me, keep my commandments. Some people get the wrong idea. We're not under the law anymore. So we don't have to do all that stuff anymore. We're under grace. As if we can do anything we want to now. We can do anything we want to. Really? So you're not under the law anymore? So when the Bible says thou shalt not murder, you can murder? That's okay. That's okay now. We're under grace. We can murder each other. Really? You shall not commit adultery? Yeah, we're under grace. We can commit adultery all we want now. Really? You shall have no other gods before me? Yeah, we can now. Because <laughs> we're under grace. See, it's ridiculous. I said it's ridiculous. And you just go on and on and on. Not being under the law does not mean that you can break all those laws in the Bible. Not being under the law means you don't have to measure up by keeping all of those laws to be saved. You're saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that right? That's what that means. But now that you're saved, yeah, we need to obey God. We need to walk in his commandments. If you love Jesus, keep his commandments. Isn't that right? So we're not keeping his commandments so that we measure up to salvation. We could never do that. We're already saved. But we keep his commandments because he loved us and he saved us. And he's the Lord. And we're not. And so we exchange lives. He took my sinful life and died with it and paid for all of it. Now I don't have to die and go to hell. Thank God. But in exchange, he gave me his righteous life where he obeyed 100% and put his righteousness in me. And he said, here, live with this, but live righteous. Live with this. I, I've obeyed 100%. Don't mess it up. <laughs> Isn't it right? Live righteous. But when we come to God, he looks at that righteousness. Thank God. See, it's the great exchange. It's the great exchange. Do you remember Jonah? Remember the story of Jonah? That's not a fairy tale that he was swallowed by. A, it's not a whale. The Bible says a great fish, big fish. Okay? He was in there three days and three nights in the fish. Why? Because he had a wrong attitude. Why? Because God told him, Jonah, I want you to go to the city of Nineveh. I know they're your enemies. I know they're your enemies. But I want you to go to the city of Nineveh, and I want you to warn them that in 40 days, I'm going to bring judgment on them because of their sin. And Jonah didn't want to go. You know why? Because he was concerned, knowing God, that they're going to repent and that God's going to relent and not do it. And he wanted them to be destroyed, so he took off running the other way. He didn't want to do it. And so God had to get Jonah's attention, caused up a bunch of stuff, had him swallowed by the fish, and the, swift, the fish barfs him out. And it, he, he didn't have a full attitude change, but he had enough attitude change that, okay, I'll go tell him. But when he got there to tell him, here's what he did. He walked into the city and he said, 40 days from now, you're going to be destroyed. He walked out. No compassion whatsoever. No explanation. No explanation whatsoever. No instruction on what you can do. Uh-uh. That's it. I made the announcement. I'm done. <laughs> well, guess what? They took it seriously. The word got back to the king. And the king got afraid because he thought, oh, man, we know we're, we're wicked people. And so the king told everybody, hey, we got to repent. Everybody, we got to repent before we're destroyed. And he called a fast. He said, nobody eats anything, even animals. He called a fast of animals. Nobody, no animals, nobody's eating anything. Everybody stop. We need to repent. We need to repent before this God that brought us this message. And they repented. And sure enough, God relented and didn't send the disaster on them, didn't judge them. It was another hundred years 
when they continued to persist 100 years later that Nineveh was finally destroyed again. But right then, God relented. Why? They were like those fools in Psalm 107. They, they repented and God didn't bring the judgment. Thank God. That's a word for somebody in here. If you'll repent, God won't bring the judgment. Amen. If you'll repent, God won't bring the judgment. See? But notice, Jonah had to have an attitude check. And when God relented and didn't bring the judgment, Jonah was depressed because he wanted them to be destroyed. Boy, I tell you what, our selfishness, we just look at this with such a myopic view, just so narrow-minded, so self-centered, instead of seeing God's trying to reach the whole world before it's too late. And we need to be about the Father's business. All right, here's another way to prepare. We need to believe that we receive when we pray. We need to believe that we receive when we pray. Hebrews 4.16 says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. How do you come to the throne of grace? God's throne. Well, you can't just walk into heaven up there because you're here on the earth. But in prayer, you do. When you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you. You're coming right into the throne of heaven. But notice this. The Bible says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Why boldly? Why boldly? How can you, an imperfect person who's messed up time and again, come boldly to the throne of grace? One way, because there is a human being who was obedient 100% of the time, who honored God 100% of the time, and took that righteousness that he had and gave it to you as a free gift. And now... By the blood that he shed to pay for your sins and by his grace, you can walk boldly into the throne of grace and obtain mercy. In fact, did you know that if you confess your sin before God, did you know that if you come into the throne of grace, oh, Father, oh, I'm so unworthy. Oh, I don't deserve to be here. Oh, did you know that's not honoring to God? It's a slap in the face. It's really a slap in the face to Jesus seated at his right hand. Because what you're saying is, I know you paid the ultimate price. You died with my sin. Your blood drained out of your body to pay for my sin. I know you took my place. You died. You were buried. But it wasn't enough. I'm still a sinner. You didn't do a good enough job. I'm still a sinner. It's a slap in the face. Not honoring. You know what true humility is? I submit to what you said, not to what I feel. And if you say I'm righteous by the grace of Jesus Christ, then I walk in here even feeling regret for the sin, but I walk in here saying, if you say I'm righteous, Father, I come boldly in here. By the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you again, Jesus. Thank you again. I know it's because of you, not me. Father, I come and I ask you right now, as the righteousness of God in Christ, can you see how that honors God? That says, I believe you, not what I feel. I believe you. I believe what Jesus did, not what I did. I believe in him more than myself. Can you see that? Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Jesus said, and whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive, believing you will receive, not just asking and not asking a thousand times. Well, I don't believe it, so I'll just ask so many times. No, he said, whatever you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. We need to believe. And how do you believe? Well, go back to the promises of God. Go back to the scriptures that'll help your faith be strengthened. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Go back to 1 John 1, 9. That shows you that you're washing the blood of Jesus from your sin when you confess it. And go over and over to say, okay, I may not feel emotionally like I'm clean, but according to the word, I am clean. I've confessed it, so therefore I'm clean. Isn't that right? See, and you, you just take out his word and you get yourself up to the truth. Just because you feel a certain way, that doesn't mean it's truth. Isn't that right? How many of you know you can be married and wake up and not feel married? That's not the truth. You should not act on how you feel. You might get killed. 
Is that right? Emotions lie all the time. See, we got to find out, but what's real? But what's real? You got to act on what's true and not just how you feel. See? Okay, so encourage yourself in the word. Now, here's another one. Walk by faith. Once you pray in faith, okay, now walk by faith. Now walk by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith and not by what? Sight. You may not see the prayer coming to pass yet, but you walk by faith. You walk as if God is working on it. He's doing it. He's bringing it to pass. And you walk expecting that. You remember this story? Mark 5, 25. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. Do you remember that? How long did she have a flow of blood? 12 years. And it goes on to say, and had suffered many things, not from the flow of blood, from many physicians. Many physicians. She didn't just go to one because the first one was practicing. Can you imagine being treated by physicians who are practicing medicine 2,000 years ago? (laughs) Trying to stop this blood? Eat this. Drink this. Do this. Put this on you. You know, whatever. I mean, trying everything they can. And the Bible says she suffered many things from many physicians, many physicians, one after another, trying this and that and the other. And she suffered by what they told her to do. She suffered by what they told her to do. But notice this. It says she spent all that she had on these physicians and was no better, but rather grew worse. So 12 years into this, not only is she worse off, but she's been suffering with all these practices, all these attempts by these physicians to get her well, and now she's flat broke. 12 years this has been going on. But look at this, verse 27. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd. She wasn't supposed to be in a crowd because according to Jewish law, if you're bleeding, you're unclean. And now if anybody touches you, they're unclean. Religiously, ritually, they're unclean. They can't go to the temple because they're unclean. You're not supposed to be around people because you're unclean. See? But notice this. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. See, there's faith there. If only I might touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you, and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him. And told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith, your faith, your faith has made you well. Now somebody said, well, it's the power of God that came from Jesus. Yes, but what triggered it? Is that right? If you walk up to the light switch and you flip the light switch on and the lights come on and somebody said, who turned the light on? And they say, well, he did. He he turned the light on. You don't say, no, I'm not an electrician. No, no, I, I just flipped the switch. I didn't turn the lights on. No, no, you did turn the lights on. No, 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 I don't even understand electricity. I don't know how light bulbs work. I, I, I didn't do anything. Yes, you did. You may not understand jack about it, but you're the one that flipped the switch and caused that to happen. Isn't that right? And that's what Jesus is saying. Daughter, you flipped the switch and released power to come out for me. I didn't flip it. You did. You did. Now listen to this. Was it the will of God for her to be healed? Yes, it was. Let me ask this. Was it the will of God 12 years before that she be healed? Yes, it was. But she wasn't. But she wasn't. But she wasn't. It was was the will of God 11 years ago that she be healed. It was the will of God 10 years ago that she be healed. It was the will of God nine years ago that she be healed, but she wasn't. 
eight years ago, but she wasn't. Seven years ago, but she wasn't. This is the daughter of Abraham. She's got a covenant with God. Is that right? She's got a covenant with God. Six years ago, five years ago, but she wasn't. Suffered another year. More prescriptions. More practicing. Isn't that right? Suffering, more suffering, even though it's the will of God. Even though it's the will of God. Another year, another year, another year. But something changed. What changed? She heard about Jesus and it brought faith. But then she acted on it. She walked by faith. See, we get the idea. We don't know. We get the idea that, you know, Jesus was here in this town and he's ministering things. And then some, she heard and she just right around the corner. She just came around the corner. I heard about him. Where is he? But we don't know that that's the case. The Bible doesn't give that detail. It could have been that she heard through the grapevine weeks after something happened. And now she's got to track Jesus down because he's traveling. And she's got to let all of her family know, hey, I got to go. I got to go find him. I got to pack up. I got to take, close up my house or whatever. Go. I got to find him. And I go to the town where he was. He's not there anymore. Well, where did he go? He went on to this other town. And she's tracking him down. What is she doing? She's walking by faith. She's got to do something. She's got to follow through with this. And she finally gets there, and there's a big crowd. And I'm not supposed to be in a crowd. Do you see barrier after barrier? Challenge after challenge. I've got to get over this in my own heart. This is not the norm. People don't do this. This is not how people act. And yet I believe in my heart that if I could just get a hold of his clothes, I'll be well. But how do I do it? She had to walk by faith. She didn't just pray a little prayer and do nothing. She acted on her faith. She acted on her faith. And step by step, she got there and got a hold of his clothes and zoom, it happened. And Jesus said, that was you. He knew he felt the power go off from him. He knew it was the power of God that healed her. But he told her, daughter, you did that. You did that with your faith. And this is what the Lord is saying to us. You do it. Come boldly to the throne of grace and walk in faith. You know, when I see my grandchildren, oh, let me tell you, my heart lights up. Oh, my heart lights up. Yesterday, Marlene drove by our house for uh, Kimberly's up in Sacramento. She was praying with a group of people over the state. And they came by the house and two of them got out of the car and came up. When I saw them coming, I oh, my heart just swelled up. Oh, I love them. And so I, I loved them, hugged on them and everything. But the other two the little ones were strapped in. How many of you know you don't unstrap them until you have to? <laughs> Anybody know what I mean? When you, when you got multiple kids and you got someplace to get, you don't just be unstrapping them. <laughs> like, oh, no. Because they just started you know, going wherever, right? And so they were still, they were still locked, all right? And so I went out. I went out to them. I didn't unstrap them either because they were on their way somewhere. But, oh, I kissed them. I loved them. I, made, I just want to make them smile. I want to make them laugh. I want to make them feel loved. How much more does the Father want to do that to you? You're not coming to a God. He's not saying you again. <laughs> no way. No way. But I tell you what I love. When they see me, they'll go, Papa. And that's what the Father wants to hear from you. <laughs> Father, Daddy, oh, I'm okay now because I'm with you. Oh, I'm all right now because I know you'll always look out for my good. I know I'm always safe with you. Last week, I was walking through the hallway here. There are all you know, kinds of people in here. And here comes Jonathan with some of the kids. And there's Noah. And I looked at him, he hadn't seen me yet. And I looked at him, and he's walking like this, looking at all the grown-ups up there, you know, just with his, his little timid face, looking at them all. And then he caught my eyes, and instantly he smiled. <laughs> instantly, because I know that one's on my side. <laughs> I know that one's on my side. I know that one loves me. Is that right? I don't know all these other people, but that one, he loves me. As soon as he caught my eyes, 
a smile came to his face. And I enjoyed watching the transition in his face. And that's what the Father wants to see in your face. That when you come, you realize, oh, here's somebody on my side. Here's somebody looking out for me. He loved me so much, he sent his own son and killed him so that he could have me in his family. Oh, I found somebody on my side, and not just anybody, Father God the Almighty. This is what he's saying. Prepare to receive. Stop letting your emotions tell you that you're not in favor, that you don't deserve it. Jesus gave you his deservedness. You have it as a free gift. Come in with a smile on your face and gratitude in your heart saying, I'm okay now because I'm here with you. I'm here with you. I'm here with you. Thank God. I'm here with you. Thank God. Thank God. Anybody receiving anything from this today? (laughs) Can you sense the love of God in here? Can you sense the love of God? And here, I mean, he spanked us and everything, told us about sin and wrong motives and everything else, and yet you feel loved. Because that's what good parents do. They tell you the truth, but with love. Isn't that right? With love. Now let's come and let's pray to him. Let's stand together. And let's come before the Lord today as we close this out. Praise God. Oh, our God is a good God, isn't he? Thank God. And you know what God's doing? God's saying, let me show you how to prepare to receive. Just like I showed the Israelites how to prepare. And they got it. They got out of slavery. They got out of slavery. And this is what I'm going to do for you. Follow the preparation instructions that I'm giving you. And watch what I do with you. God is faithful. He's faithful. Let's lift our hands to him right now, can we? Oh, let's say some things to him. Say, Father God, thank you for teaching me. I need it. I receive this. Thank you for correcting me, for instructing me. I receive it all. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your promises. Thank you for Jesus who gave everything for me. I receive forgiveness by his blood. I receive the grace that came through him. I consider myself now forgiven because you consider me forgiven. I ask you to strengthen me to walk in obedience, to do your will according to your plan. Thank you for blessing my life. Thank you for providing for me, healing me, protecting me, promoting me at the right time and in the right way. I trust you, Lord. And I'm so glad you are with me and on my side in Jesus' name. And can we say amen and thank God for his word today.